Welcome to the cantina. You're just in time for happy hour. The weather outside is frightful, but this tequila is so delightful. It's the holiday season, and as we all know, this year is different than those before it, but we play the cards we're dealt. Point in fact, yesterday is the first time I trim my hair myself. So as long as I go with the aggressively tousled look, it hopefully reads more beachy than boozy. Although life does imitate art, it's kind of like looking at a Pollock rather than a Leon Comer. Speaking of art, how's that for a segue? Let's jump into it, because do I have the story for you. Grab yourself a drink, and let's jump into it. Let's detox on the rocks. Salut! Have you ever seen something in a storefront window that was so beautiful you just had to have it? Well, it's the way I feel every time I pass the LCBO, but that is small beans compared to my next story. Let's start with the Boston heist paintings. Who doesn't love a good cat burglar story? Let me take you back. Picture it. St. Patrick's Day, March 18, 1990. Two men disguised as police officers bamboozled security guards at the Isabella mm, Stewart Gardner Museum. Once inside, they tied up everyone, including security, then Oceans 2 got to work. They made off with $500 million worth of art. That's USD. Not Euros, don't get too excited. The best part of this story? Officials are no closer to solving this mystery 30 years later. That's right. The 90s were 30 years ago. Oof. I know I was just a dirty thought and a little kid, but still. There are a number of theories on what happened to the art, ranging from the Irish mob to California screenwriters. Among the 13 pieces of art taken were works by Rembrandt, Degas, and Manet, who I've always preferred to Monet, there's a $10 million, again, USD reward for information leading to the artwork's recovery. So that covers artwork that's been lost. But guess what? There's also art that's just been found by graffiti artist Banksy. Eileen Macon, Macon? Eileen's house, which had previously been put up on the market, has just received an amazing early Christmas gift in the form of a Banksy mural being painted on the side of her Bristol home. The mural shows an older, all right, old like grandma, even though there are definitely hot grandmas, but this is like an older, older looking lady sneezing. Now, in this mural, and you can Google it super easily because it's everywhere, you can see her dentures flying out of her mouth while her <laughs> purse and cane fly away from her as well. Residents noticed this incredible mural. Incredible because of A, the social commentary, and B, the significance of it on December 10th. Bristol is in England, by the way. This has been dubbed the Achu mural, garnering international attention. So how do we know this is a real, true Banksy piece? Well, Banksy himself, or herself, no one definitively knows the identity of Banksy that's part of the allure. It's like in Jaws, once you saw the shark, it was way less exciting, kind of like Sia's nose. I'm not denying the talent, I'm just saying there's something to be said for a little mystique. So this of course has sent the value of the house absolutely skyrocketing as some of Banksy's art sells in the millions and millions of pounds. One quick question though, is graffiti graffiti because it's not 
quote unquote allowed to be there? I mean, really, what differentiates a graffiti piece from a mural? I mean, Diego Rivera is a muralist, right? Why isn't he considered a graffiti artist? I mean, it's all art, don't get me wrong, but what really differentiates it? Is it the spray can? Is it the permit? There is graffiti and there are murals the world round. Actually, it's a personal hobby and passion of mine. Every time I go anywhere, I need to see the local artwork. I mean, true art doesn't really need approval from anyone, right? Art's meant to be controversial. So what makes it art and what makes it a public nuisance? Just musings from a musing, Let's call myself a cocktail artist. All right, I like to drink. <laughs> so let's segue this into... What's in your glass? <laughs> There's nothing like a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice in the morning, is there? Well, I'm sure we could sexy it up just a little. This vitamin-rich juice could use a little beta-carotene, maybe tons of vitamin A, oh, and maybe some vodka. Today, I'm sipping on a what's up, doc. My eyes are brighter, my skin is glowing, and the sass is in full effect. This is the drink that will bring out the waskily wabbit in anyone. Well, getting your glow on. This drink is bright and sunny, and the perfect drink for brunch, lounging around the house, maybe cocktail with lunch, doing laundry, washing your hair, or merely contemplating the pointlessness of existence. Hmm. As always, fresh is best. If you don't have any freshly squeezed orange juice or freshly squeezed carrot juice, make your life and your wallet happy and just buy what's on sale. Now, you've probably noticed I like to measure out cocktails by measuring by the shot glass. That is both A, because it's just easier, and B, it's part of my life philosophy. It's a fun rule of thumb in general. Take life one shot glass at a time. Feel free to quote me. <laughs> Some people have a Swiss army knife. I've got a shot glass and a flask. All right, so take your trusty shot glass. Now this usually measures 1.5 ounces. They can differ slightly. Sometimes one ounce, sometimes it's a caballito and it's almost two. But I use the philosophy of if less is more, then think how much more, more will be. By the way, that is a blatant ripoff slash homage to Fraser. Since we're going with the 90s theme, Hashtag Roz Doyle is a queen. So what you want to do is take one shot glass of orange juice, two shot glasses of carrot juice, one shot of vodka, and one shot of ginger beer. Now, if you're a fan of Bloody Marys, this is almost a guaranteed love to your repertoire because it's vegetable juice based and it's really not that sweet. I really recommend trying to get your hands on ginger beer specifically over ginger ale. You're going to get a lot more intense, kind of deeper, better developed flavor. If you can't get ginger beer, again, don't stress, just use ginger ale. But if you're at the grocery store, I recommend maybe asking someone or taking a look. So combine your orange juice, your carrot juice, and your vodka over ice. Shake what your mama gave you. And make sure to not add your ginger beer or ginger ale until after this is fully mixed. Don't shake soda. I know it sounds silly, but you never know. Also, if this is like your third <laughs> cocktail mixing experience of the day, just a little reminder. Not that I'm speaking from personal experience. Now, this drink does not require much garnish, but if you want to get a little bougie, as we all do, I actually put on earrings before I record because it makes me feel extra confident. You can take some sliced ginger, if you love ginger, and add some to either the rim of your glass or just throw it in there. It's your drink. It's your day. It's your call. What's nice about this drink is it feels healthy. And 
if you really look at the ingredients, it's vegetables, fruit, and vodka is usually made from potatoes. I'm looking at you, Ciroc. Not my favorite. I mean, this drink is basically a salad. So, have a salad in a glass. Salut! We are big animal lovers around here. So if you're looking for pure, undiluted joy, I highly, highly, strongly recommend checking out Finnegan Fox and Finnegan Fox Fridays. You can find this by going to Save a Fox Rescue. Now this is an incredible organization and I actually came across them on YouTube. Apparently the government is listening to me through my cell phone and computer, but in this instance, they kind of got it right. The algorithm worked because I have straight up binge watched Finnegan Fox every single day since I first discovered him. It's true, my newest crush is Finnegan Fox. And he really does answer the age old, okay, a few years old question of what does the fox say? Well, he laughs more than a speech dialect coach trying to decipher Lindsay Lohan's bizarre, quote, accent. Okay, I am going to dip my toe for the first time into the true crime arena because the Zodiac Killer's cipher has been deciphered by the newbie codebreakers of Jarl von Eyck, a Belgian computer programmer, David Oranchek, an American software developer, and Sam Blake, an Australian mathematician. Now these three worked it out. Let's start from the beginning. There's tons of information on the Zodiac Killer. If you're interested, I highly recommend My Favorite Murder because these ladies cover it beautifully. Really, you type in Zodiac Killer and you're gonna find a ton of information. Ooh, and the Jake Gyllenhaal movie with, um, oh, who is it? He absolutely kills it. Ooh, Robert Downey Jr. and Mark Ruffalo. Excellent, excellent, and it doesn't get into like the nitty gritty goriness, so you can watch it without worrying if you can get to sleep that night. <laughs> I like just enough to be titillated, but not enough to make me an insomniac more than I already am. All right, so basically, the Zodiac Killer released these ciphers where he was taunting the FBI, the police. I mean, the guy was a serial killer. Let's not mince words here. Now, he did release a code that no one was able to break. And 51 years later, the infamous maniac's letters, way back in 1969, not way, way back, but not yesterday, have been cracked by these three gentlemen. Now, the letter itself that they've deciphered it's straight up insanity. I'm not going to read it out because it's not graphic. It's more unsettling and that's not what we're into here. Well, just a little. When it comes to our livers, was deemed the 340 cipher. And it hadn't been solved until very, very recently. Now, these three gentlemen worked together to figure it out. And I know I'm repeating myself, but the FBI, the police, and countless experts have been working tirelessly. Now, the trio used a unique program and went through 650,000 variations of trying to crack this code. And it did not give us the Zodiac Killer's identity, but the point I want to make here is it just goes to prove perseverance, persistence and good old refusing to give up pays off nothing but respect for you gentlemen well done boys this episode has been brought to you by rage plain old anger is for people who are able to manage their emotions in a healthy mature way rage is at the intersection of complete frustration and behaving like an absolute lunatic with complete abandon. Fully commit to the insanity, embrace the lunacy, and ignore the heart palpitations. 
just make sure your outbursts are in an open field, by yourself, nowhere near any living thing. As long as you're not operating heavy machinery or have access to fire, consider rage. Well, that's the end of my drink and the end of the show. And in light of the Christmas season, I think it's heartwarming to know. Blood donors in Sweden get a text when their blood is used. No joke there, I just thought it was nice. <laughs> Salut! This has been a Cat Flap production. In association with Not For Sale Media.